Well, good day to you. My name is Sean, and I'm the pastor here at Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. I'm so glad that you are here with us. You might be fellowshipping with us through broadcast, but we consider you an important member of our Calvary Chapel, Birmingham family. So it's good to have you with us. While you're here, do me a favor, and if you haven't already, click subscribe and ring that bell so that you are notified whenever a new video is posted. Also, if you could share this video with your friends and family, that would help us to put faithful Bible teaching into the hands of even more people. I know that many of you give when you are able to attend church, but please continue to give to the church even when you are unable to be here in person with us. Being a small church, Giving tends to be small in amount and, well, sparse. But if you don't give, we can't afford rent, we can't afford utilities, and we will be unable to broadcast as we do. Without being here at the church, there are several ways you can give. You can give by mail, either set up an automatic uh, contributions through your bank or perhaps a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online at www.calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, just click on giving, and it will take you to a page where you can give a one-time gift, or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please pray about giving into this ministry so we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. The world is spinning and I'm dizzy staring at the stars I left the pages in my schedule but they're falling hard a little different this morning. We usually start in Corinthians, and, and uh, I'm going to start in Exodus this morning. In, in Exodus 12, we find that the Hebrew nation has been in slavery for 400 years, and God has sent a redeemer. He sent Moses to Pharaoh, and he said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said no, and God sent a series of plagues upon the nation of Egypt. And, and he got to the tenth plague, and he said, at midnight on this given night, the angel of death, my messenger, is going to go through the land of Egypt, and every firstborn is going to die. Every firstborn from the house of Pharaoh down to the servant girl in the barn, the firstborn is going to die, and all the firstborn of the cattle are going to die. And this is my plague and my judgment on Egypt and their gods. And, and then he said, Moses, go to the, my people, the Hebrew people, and tell them to get a lamb and take it home, and make it a family pet for 14 days, and then kill it. And, and eat the Passover meal in the way that God told them to. But he said, take some of the blood from that lamb, and put it on the lintel over the doorpost, and on the doorposts of the house. 
And he said, when the angel of death comes through the nation of Egypt and kills the firstborn in every house, it will pass over that house that has the blood on the door. And, and the blood will be a, a sign that you are believing in me and trusting in me, and it will be a deliverance. And, and on that night, the firstborn in every house without the blood died. But in the house that had blood on the door, no one died. It was a deliverance from God. It was God's Passover. And then God said, I want you to have a meal every year, a festival. It's a whole week. All the, the, the Hebrews would come from everywhere in, in the, 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 the known world at the time. They'd come back to Jerusalem. And they would celebrate a week party, week-long party. And it would end in the Passover Seder, the meal. And, and this was a remembrance. And God said, I want you, when you eat this meal, every year to remember that I brought you up out of slavery and set you free. And up until that day, God had identified himself as, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And after the Passover, he said, I am the God who brought you up out of slavery, out of Egypt. And I want you to remember, and I want you to have this meal and this party for a week and celebrate. And then one night, Jesus, with his disciples, came to that supper of memorial. And he said, all these years that you've done this thing, in remembrance, has been a prophecy of what I'm going to do on the cross. I am the Passover lamb. And he brought a new meaning to it. You see, all of life, all of humanity is condemned to futility in this life and then to eternal death in the next life. All humanity is condemned. Jesus said in, in John 3.17, He said, I did not come to condemn the world. The world is condemned already. I've come to bring it life. You see, in, in the Garden of Eden, one sacrifice was required per person as God provided skins to cover the shame of their nakedness. And, and on the, the, the day of Passover, there was one sacrifice per family. On the day of atonement for the nation of Israel, there was one sacrifice for the nation. But on the cross, one sacrifice for all people, for all time, Jesus said, I am the Passover lamb. And Jesus promises today that if we will let him put the blood of the cross over the doorpost to the heart of our soul, he will pass over us with the final judgment of eternal death, and we can be with him forever. Jesus is the final Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our future in heaven with God. And on that night that he stood with his disciples, he said, this is me. Take this in remembrance and in prophecy of what I am going to do. And for us, we take it in remembrance and thankfulness, and we take it knowing that he's coming back again. Take it with me, please. The bread of the Lamb. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Son so that we can stand before you righteous and holy by his blood, not by our own merits, not by our own work not by anything we've done or anything we could do or anything we will do. We come to you in the blood of Christ and we know that you will pass over us with judgment and we will have not eternal death, we will have eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. We thank you, we praise you, and we anticipate his coming again as we take this cup together in his name. Please. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Come ye sinners Poor and needy Who can win this Sick and soul Jesus ready Stands to save you 
full of pity, love and power. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me with his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are Ten thousand charms. So come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty glorified. True belief and true repentance. Every grace that brings you nigh, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me with his arm. And in the arms of my dear Savior, for there are ten thousand so come ye weary heavy laden lost and ruined by the fall and if you tarry till you're better you will never come at all. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me with his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand father thank you so much for your love father that you did love us when we were yet sinners when we are sinners even in one sense lord you're always there always waiting to embrace us lord so as we Continue on in this service and worship you through the bringing of your word as Pastor Sean will come. Uh, Lord, we just thank you again that we can be together and that we can share this time uh, of worship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, we'll take a few minutes as we kind of rearrange some things and there's some treats and stuff in the back, coffee. Feel free to partake and to fellowship. Amen. All right. So if you have not already, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. We are moving into chapter 20, but we didn't finish out 19 last week. Or not last week. Last week we were in Hebrews, but the week before that. <clears throat> So, look down to the bottom of the chapter, and we're going to start reading from verse 27. It says, Then Peter answered and said to him, that is to Jesus, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Peter was uh, 
he never was one just to hold back. And uh, I'll read that, of course, as I said uh, a couple of weeks ago. My, my first thought when I read that is, Peter, you really need to learn to zip it. Um, but as I said last week, Jesus doesn't respond with a rebuke. Um, and so I, I think this was taken the right way. Um, but what, what bothers me about it is, you know, Jesus is he's heading to Jerusalem where he would suffer terribly and he would die not because of his sins, he was sinless, but he would die for our sins. And he had explained to his disciples several times that 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 terrible suffering and, and that death was was waiting for him in Jerusalem. And I read what Peter says there, and I kind of see myself in that. And I think about the times when I have approached the Lord in prayer and probably very inconsiderately <laughs> asked for my own way, asked what was in it for me, or why things weren't going my way, without considering just who I was talking to. But now Peter, he, he essentially is asking Jesus, what is it that we get out of following you? And thinking about it this way, it really was just the wrong question to ask. And yet it, it's such a natural question. It, it, it comes naturally to all of us to ask that question. And obviously, Peter had, had latched on to the treasures in heaven statement Jesus made to the rich ruler of the, the previous section. And if the question was indelicate, again, we notice Jesus' response wasn't a rebuke, and neither was it scolding. Instead, Jesus took Peter's question and used it to further teach teaching His disciples, and by extension, of course, teaching us through this written word today. Let's start with that, that word that probably popped out at all of us when we read that, and that was that word regeneration, right? It's a Greek word, palingenesia, meaning regeneration, just that, and renewal. And if you're reading in the ESV and some of the more modern translations, you actually won't see the word regeneration. You will see new world. And that might be confusing to you because you may be accustomed to thinking of regeneration as being born again. Jesus explained this in that way to Nicodemus in John 3. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul writing to Titus in chapter 3 in verse 5 of that little book also used this same Greek word for regeneration and applied it to being born again. And this is spiritual new birth, being born again, necessary according to Jesus, to see the kingdom of God. And it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit when we trust in Jesus, we're, we're justified. We are also sanctified in that we are indwelt and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit as belonging to God. However, when the Holy Spirit enters us, He renews us and begins this work of transforming us into the image of Christ. And thus we have regeneration. But this is, this is actually beyond the scope of our study here in, in Matthew 19 because that is not what Jesus is actually talking about. Now, Calvinists, by the way, and those who hold to Reformed theology say that regeneration or new birth precedes faith. But without allegorizing Scripture, you really can't support that view. But again, beyond the scope of our message this morning, because 
the renewal that Jesus speaks of is that which those who are renewed look forward to. That is, the next age. Now, there's also an occurrence of this word in an early non-canonical Christian letter from an elder in the church of Rome to uh, the Christians of Corinth. And that letter is called First Clement. It was probably written around 96 AD. And in it, the same Greek word was used speaking of the new beginning to the world, or, or what we might call the next age after the great flood uh, with Noah and the living creatures being saved from the judgment. And it's, it's used in a similar way here. When Jesus says in the regeneration, he's speaking of the future after the great tribulation, when the world is renewed. So then we have the translation as it reads in the New English Translation Bible. It says, in the age when all things are renewed. So the conditions of, of when Jesus is speaking of are, and remember he's speaking to his disciples, in the age when all things are renewed, and the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory. Jesus says that in the renewal, the twelve will participate in the final establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth, when Israel will be restored to the land and the twelve will rule under Jesus. Twelve disciples, twelve thrones. Of course, we know that Judas was a false disciple. In the book of Acts, the disciples appointed another to take his place, and that was Mattias. Nothing else is heard of Mattias in Scripture, but there is no reason to assume that he was uh, somehow illegitimate. There are multiple traditions about what Mattias did. One says he ministered in Ethiopia, another Damascus, and, and still another in Jerusalem. All the traditions, however, agree that Mattias was martyred. There was also Paul, who was later numbered as an apostle. Now, thrones are, are mentioned in John's vision of, of one heavenly scene in, in chapter 4 of Revelation. Only there we see 24 thrones. Scripture doesn't tell us those are the same thrones, nor exactly who are in them. I have my theories, of course. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 1, which speaks of a regenerated world in which God restores judges and counselors. Perhaps those 24 thrones will be occupied by, by some order of patriarchs and the apostles. I, I don't think we can say for sure, but again, it's beyond the scope of our study this morning. So moving on, Jesus then broadened the, broadened, uh, the scope of what he's talking about beyond his disciples. Everyone, he says in verse 29, and that is all-inclusive, meaning all who trust in Jesus. Now let's start with this. Those who trust in Jesus share in his victory. It's implied in what Jesus says to his disciples, but it is clearly stated in verse 29. And it is true, as Peter wrote, that in this world, we may partake in Christ's sufferings and be reproached for the name of Christ. But as much as a Christian may give up or endure, we will receive in the kingdom far more than we ever gave up or suffered. A couple of observations that, that need to be made here. As we observed when Jesus was speaking with the, the ruler in the previous section, the emphasis of what Jesus is saying is not eternal life. The Bible is very clear, and Jesus' own words in other places in the Bible are very clear. Forgiveness of sins and eternal life come by simple trust in Jesus. Jesus here is not saying that we play a role in deserving or achieving eternal life. Rather, rewards that, he may, that, that we may receive due to how we have lived for Jesus or, or, um, or things we have done uh, uh, for His name, uh, these are in addition to eternal life. Thus the phrase, we'll receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. 
Secondly, this is not a command from Jesus, nor is it license from Jesus to reject or leave spouse or family. Nor is it a command for Christians to leave their jobs. I say jobs because the word that's translated as lands is literally fields, as society at that time was primarily agricultural. Most jobs had something to do with work in fields. Of course, there have been many who have left to, to go to foreign lands in order to minister the gospel, but if they did so by way of neglecting or abandoning a husband, a wife, or their children, well, that is certainly not pleasing to the Lord. Sometimes one might come to faith and then decide that, that we must leave behind friends. We must somehow closet ourselves away from society. But Christians are not born again into a lonesome life, but into the body of Christ. So yes, we are brought into a new family, so to speak, but we are not called to be friendless nor to give up friends. Those friends who are not believers, they become your new mission field. So you don't have to leave for anywhere unless unless you have friends that are, are pulling you into a sinful lifestyle, an addiction or, or something like that. Thirdly, for my name's sake means that any reward is not coming from selfish ambition or or things done to further ourselves, but rather those things that are done on account of Christ. A better perspective takes into consideration this whole greater portion of life, the eternal life that belongs to the believer. So yes, Jesus lays it down that there will be surprises in the final assessment. And the Bible in places like 1 Corinthians 3 speaks of some receiving more and some receiving less. But never is the love of God for the believer or eternal life at stake. And remember, any heavenly rewards are due to the goodness of God and His power. From other things, Christians may be separated, but they can never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But rewards are not necessarily the punchline of this text. The punchline is in the next parable, which is set up, really, by verse 30. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So, now we have, with the end of chapter 19, we've built the foundation for our study in this parable that we find in chapter 20. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this new morning. We thank You for the breath that You have placed in our lungs. You cause us to wake up, Lord. You give us life. You are a truly living God, compassionate. You are merciful. You are slow to anger. You abound in steadfast love. We pray for those who are sick today and those who are traveling. Most of all, we ask that that Your Gospel would be received by all. Lord, as we embark on this study of Your incredible Word, we just ask that our hearts would be open to receive all that You have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so moving into chapter 20. Starting with verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. Stop there for a second. 
There are a few things here in this parable that I want to point out to you. First, the landowner, who is a picture of God, goes out time after time seeking laborers for his vineyard. And this reminds me of a few verses. Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. From the garden, God called out to Adam, Where are you? To sending Nathan to confront David over adultery and murder. To God sending His only Son into the world. To someone who God sent to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want to just kind of set this statement down for a little while. God has sought and He has found workers in that harvest. We might read this parable and assume that Jesus is is making up a, a pretend situation in order to make an illustration. However, that is really not the case. The, the, this text illustrates a situation that could be seen at any day in Israel. The, the setting being a vineyard, most commentaries then assume this work is, is harvesting, which would happen around the end of September before the rains would come. Harvesting was absolutely necessary to do before the rains came, otherwise the harvest could be ruined. So then work in a large vineyard would be a race against time with all hands on deck. In order to to make the most of a harvest, a landowner would assess the work of his laborers and then go out to find more if needed. In the parable, the first group of laborers agreed to a standard wage, which was a denarius a day. The denarius was a silver coin worth about a day's wage for a labor, laborer in Israel at this time. But nobody was getting rich working for a denarius a day. That was a wage which didn't leave a family any margin. Additionally, notice that this landowner didn't have a staff of workers, but from the start, he went out to hire laborers. We don't know from where he hired the first group, but the subsequent workers were found standing idle in the marketplace. And it wasn't that they were just being lazy. The context is that they were waiting for work, hoping someone would come to offer work to them. Some were so desperate for work that they, they waited there hoping someone would hire them until the 11th hour, that is 5 p.m. For them to be unemployed for a day, could possibly mean that their family went without food. The first group of laborers went to work after making an agreement with the landowner to receive a standard wage. Another group was told by the landowner that he would pay them what is right. And then he did the same thing again and again. At the very end of the day, he told another group the same thing. So then, the first group, they've been at work in the landowner's vineyard the whole day, from the first of the morning to the end of the day. The second group started work around 9 a.m. The third and fourth group started work around 12 and 3. And about 5 in the late afternoon, the final group started his work. The first group was contractually guaranteed to pay, be paid that one denarius. The other groups were to be paid by the landowner, whatever is right. And so we have the setup of the parable. Now next we have the payoff. Let's keep reading, starting at verse 8. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. 
And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own good things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. There's a whole lot here. First, notice that the landowner has a steward or a mediator distributing the wages. The Greek word for wages here is misthos, which is is used in Scripture to mean uh, remuneration for, for work done. Uh, Sometimes it means recognition for moral quality of action, such as we see in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. And also a positive reward, or in a negative case, judgment. Now, here the sense is of remuneration for the work that was done, with an underlying sense of reward. Now, also notice that at the end of the day, when payment to the workers for the group they had done was distributed. When it was all distributed, it it began with the last group, right? In other words, it started with the group that spent the least amount of time laboring in the vineyard. And they received the full standard wage of one denarius in sight of the workers who had spent more time in the vineyard. Now, we're to assume that each group was then paid the same, including the last group to receive their wages, which was the first group to have started work that day. And they received the full standard wage of one denarius. Now, notice that the first group had worked not only more hours, but they had endured the heat of the day. The last group had worked at the very end of the day as the hot sun was setting. So then, as we would expect, the first group took issue with this. And whether the complaint was made to the the steward or direct to the landowner, we're not told. However, the he, in he answered, of verse 13, that is the landowner, that is not the steward. And notice that despite their complaint, the landowner responded with friend. And then an explanation as to why he had done what he had done. He explains that it's not out of unfairness, but out of generosity, which happens to be his right, because the wages were distributed from his own riches. In verse 15, evil eye was a Jewish idiom for being envious. And a better translation of verse 15 would be as as found in the New English translation, am I not permitted to do what I want? with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? Finally, that last phrase of verse 16 is not found in the majority of manuscripts and is probably another instance of a scribe later adding this in from Matthew 22.14, either by accident or thinking that it added clarity for the readers. So then modern translations will not have that in verse 16, but will only read, so the last will be first, and the first last. Now, what is, all, what is this all about? The temptation is for us to really, really work on this and, and make it up to be this giant ball of yarn that it really was not intended to be. We'll try not to do that. But there is a, there's a lot here, and there's a lot of picture within this. Now, to start off, we certainly can see here a, a gentle warning to Jesus' disciples. 
After all, it was Peter's question from the previous chapter that had kicked off this, this brief discourse from Jesus. He had asked, See, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? The we in his statement lets us know that this, while this was Peter speaking, he was doing so on behalf of the other disciples, or at least it would, at least he was thinking he was doing so on behalf of the other disciples, right? Uh, sometimes we have probably all been included in somebody's statements and then thought, wait a second, <laughs> that wasn't what I was thinking. But of course, the text doesn't pipe up any, uh, doesn't give us any, any instance of the other disciples piping up and saying otherwise. So it does appear that Peter was again being the spokesman for the whole group. And yes, these were the twelve. These were the ones to first follow Jesus and, and the first to be given the good news to share in the world that God may have his harvest. And that was cert certainly a, a huge, just an immense privilege. But as Jesus himself recognized, they had given up much in order to follow him. And there have been, and if the Lord should tarry, there will be many more who will give up much and endure much in the name of Jesus. But in thinking the way the disciples were thinking, there was a danger of believing that there is merit on their part that they were creating a debt that God owed them. That, that because of their work, God was indebted to them. From a spiritual salvation standpoint, there, there is no earning. There is only receiving out of the generosity of God. From a rewards in heaven standpoint, there will be some disparity. Is eternal salvation a result of participating in the harvest? Or is it the result of trusting in Jesus? Well, that's it. It's simply trusting in Jesus. And those who trust in Jesus are invited to participate in the harvest. And some may participate from day one. Some may participate later in life. Others may participate when there are only a few days left. All are equally precious to the Lord. And if it were the case that eternal salvation is a result of participating in the harvest, then salvation must be distributed as a wage with some earning more than others. But eternal salvation is just that. There is no more or no less of eternal salvation. It is, by its very nature, one never-ending quantity. It cannot be earned nor merited, only given and received, and that by the generosity of God. As for those who participate in the harvest, in this parable we have those who were picking the fruit, but there also must have been those who participated in the plowing, the sowing, and so forth. And my point in stating that is that not all work done in the Father's vineyard is the same. Nor is there reason to look at one type of work and say that it's not as valuable as another type of work. The judgment of works is not up to us. And then, is all work done by all people who participate in the harvest equal? Well, of course not. And rewards will not be equal either. But remember, rewards are not owed. They are generously given by God. There are going to be some big surprises when it comes time for rewards to be handed out. It's spoken about many times in the Bible, our works being rewarded, but there is another side to this. 2 Corinthians 5 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And judgment seat there is a word I'm sure that you guys have heard before. It's Bema. 
the the bema seat was a, a raised platform it, it usually had steps going up to it and sometimes there was a, a seat there sometimes it was just the platform it was used by officials to address assemblies or or to make pronouncements and of of course to judge it was usually located in the city in the city center or in a public square or marketplace in fact, there are still remains of, of a, a Bema seat in the ruins of Corinth where, where Paul would have been brought before uh, Gallio in uh, Acts 18. So this would have been a familiar picture to early Christians who were reading Matthew's Gospel. But the Bema, the, the Bema was a, a place of different kinds of pronouncements, not just judgments of, of guilt. I should say not Matthew's Gospel, but Corinthians. And this is not a, a judgment of condemnation. This is one of commendation. 1 Corinthians 3, If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. God's rewards will be so much more than any reward we have received here on earth. The rewards of the, the world, they, they are fleeting, but the rewards of heaven they don't rust, they don't perish, they don't decay. Now we may also see in this parable a warning to the chosen people, Israel. They took great pride in being God's chosen people and they looked down on the Gentiles, hating, even despising the Gentiles, so much so that they even hoped for their destruction. Now, remember that the early, early, early church was primarily Jewish. So then this attitude threatened to be carried forward into the Christian church. That if Gentiles were allowed into the church, they must be inferior. But Paul confronted this attitude in Galatians. He said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is nobody who can claim special in particular place in God's heart because they were Christians first. All men and women, no matter when they come, are equally precious to God. If we think that we deserve something because of our time, diligence, our commitment to service, we have negated the real value of what we have done. All who respond to the grace of God are equal disciples. And we must be careful not to measure our worth by what we have done or what we have sacrificed. Some are called to sacrifice more. Some are called to sacrifice less. Some to work more. Others to work less. But we are all saved by grace. And so we can serve with grateful hearts because we don't have to worry about worthiness. If we begin to make comparisons, we question the wisdom and the fairness of God. And we risk ourselves becoming envious of others. So we find in this parable comfort we also find in this parable compassion. But perhaps the greatest thing we find here is generosity. There was disparity in the amount of work that was done by each group of workers. Some worked all day. Some worked part of the day. Some worked only a small part of the day. However, they received the same pay, not because of the amount of work nor the quality of their work, but because the landowner is, by his own words, generous. 
And all that God gives is by grace. We cannot earn what God gives. We cannot deserve it. What God gives is given out of the goodness of His heart. What God gives is not pay, but a gift. Not a reward, but a grace. And with all this said, we come to what may be the greatest lesson, I believe, of this parable. While there are five obvious groups of workers, there are also only two. One group came to an agreement with the landowner. They had a contract. They said, we agree to work for you for a specific amount. Their concern was to get as much as possible from working for this landowner. The other workers all came to work having been offered what is right. There was no contract. They wanted just the opportunity to work, leaving the final payment up to the landowner. We don't know what the relationship of the workers was to the landowner, whether they knew of him before they went to work for him. But we... We have God's Word, and we have this record of Him. And it shows us that He is good. We don't have to ask, what do we get out of it? And we are therefore free to serve the Lord in whatever field He places us without worry that what we are doing isn't enough. The world says that we need to be doing big things. Worldly churches say the same thing. And there are many believers in this world who have earned great rewards in this world, but will have a very low place in the kingdom because rewards were their sole thought. There are many believers who are poor in this world, but will be great in heaven because they simply trusted God and were faithful in little things. And so we see how it is that Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first. God is fair and faithful. And I know that's a little bit short for this morning, but we're going to stop right there so that we can pick up in a very good spot next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for the marvelous things that You have done in our lives, Lord. We thank You for the love that You have revealed to us, for the love that we get to share together as as Your body. Lord, we pray that all these words that were of You were sown into the hearts today and that a harvest would come from them. Watch over and protect them, Lord. Where there is sin in our lives that we need to confess and perhaps others that we need to go to to ask forgiveness of, Lord, we ask that You would give us the courage to do so. We also thank You that You are quick to forgive. Lord, help us to be forgivers. 
as we have all been forgiven of so much. Many here endure various hardships. Father, I pray that You would help them to endure and that You would be glorified and they're looking to You rather than looking to others. Guard our hearts. Lord, keep our hands from evil. Lord, protect us from our enemy, the devil, Lord. And as we endure the many trials that we know this, that are in this life, we ask you to be glorified through them. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who we are in you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. I'm closing chapters, looking backwards, and I'm making sense. I'm interested in all that flourishes from ignorance. Nothing in my way now, except for my own years. The world is spinning, and I'm dizzy staring at the stars.